Okay, well, there's nobody left in the waiting room, so I'll just uh, open this up and start off. Uh, I can't actually, Keith is here, but now he's lost in a sea of faces, but um, I'll just give him a very quick introduction. Um, I'm here. He's, he's joining us this morning from Scotland. Um, I'm very happy to introduce him as our new Senior Communications Advisor at Union Merit. Um, it's probably the first time most of you will have seen him, but he's actually already making a real difference uh, for us behind the scenes in comms um, and also with our new uh, comprehensive innovation for sustainable development teams. He's had a couple of meetings uh, with the team leaders. And all so far, um, all of that's been working remotely. So I guess that's uh, one silver lining to the pandemic that uh, we can have people like Keith joining us and uh, helping us uh, so, so easily. Um, I met Keith uh, almost 20 years ago uh, whilst I was doing my masters and I did a short internship at Chatham House uh, think tank in London. And uh, he, was, he was then I think working as a press officer and um, that uh, sadly, but uh, kind of interestingly coincided with the US invasion of Iraq. So we're talking uh, early 2003, basically. And I remember doing a lot of press releases and media work with, with senior researchers, uh, people like Rosemary Hollis, who at the time was, was a regular fixture on BBC Newsnight every night at 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. Um, and definitely her briefings were a lot more believable than Colin Powell's. I can tell you that for nothing. And uh, she, was, she was a real character, fiercely intellectual, a great sense of humor, uh, a bit like our Franziska, I would say. Um, so um, anyway, a lot's happened since then. So I'll pass you over directly to Keith and to, just to hear a little bit more about his background and what these uh, intriguing stepping stones to policymakers actually are. So Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, uh, you mentioned Rosemary, who sadly died quite unexpectedly a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, she was, she was an academic who was a very good communicator or very able to digest her ideas and research and boil it down. And, she, was, and she, she built a team around her of very credible Middle East experts. And they were all very good. At this. They were all very good communicators. And because they came from the region, they were, they were uh, credible as well. But yeah, those were, those were, those were good times, Howard. Um, okay, I'm going to, if you just bear with me a second while I share my screen and just make sure that I can pull up the presentation. Okay, can I just need to check, can everyone see the screen? Oops, I need to go back. Oh my god, I need to go back to the beginning. I gave half the game away there. Um, <laughs> Is, is that okay? Is, the screen is visible, yes? Anyone, Howard? Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, well, I'll start. I, I have, I think, maybe about uh, 20 or 30 slides. Um, and obviously, they'll be dominant on the screen. So I, I'm in a slightly makeshift setup here, but um, the connection's good, and I hope you can all hear me. So. Um, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to break my presentation down into uh, six sections and then we should have plenty of time, so 25, 30 minutes for Q&A. And my broad aim is to start a conversation about impact and to perhaps generate some ideas how we can have a bit more of it um, from a UNU merit perspective. So first I'll introduce myself uh, briefly, but a bit of who I am and why I'm here. Uh, I'll then outline what is a very crowded policy field and look at where there is overlap between how universities and think tanks can aim for policy impact. I have two case studies as illustrations and my ideas and thoughts are being presented in the context of UNU Merit's strategic plan, as well as our comm strategy, as well as drawing, for example, on the very thorough strategy for policy and societal engagement, which was an internal working group uh, led by Nordine and that reported their findings in May of last year. So the presentation, as I said, should be about 25 uh, minutes, but if there's anything pressing, uh, just ask uh, during, but hopefully we'll have time for the Q&A after. So first, um, just a tiny bit about me. Um, my previous roles are largely, uh, certainly in the last 20 years, uh, I was Managing Director for Communications and Publishing at Chatham House, 
which means I was re responsible for the communications and publishing strategy, the media relations, the digital comms, measuring and aiding impact and engaging new and diverse audiences, and especially uh, that the, the latter uh, more lately. I also oversaw the journal International Affairs and the magazine The World Today, and I was co-chair of an initiative called the Colab, which was created two year, two three years ago, uh, as an innovation hub to deliver "quote unquote" immersive experiences, and that included simulations, interactive digital content, and physical and online exhibitions. And at UNU Merit, my role is senior advisor of communications. So I'm working with Howard and his team, and there are probably probably three elements to my role which is to support the implementation of the communications related strategic objectives in the Institute's strategic plan, i.e. to make UNU Merit the go-to place for comprehensive innovation for sustainable development, as well as other work that we're working on. And to work on profile raising events and seminars and other initiatives, again, largely associated with comprehensive innovation. And finally, to help think about how we can measure and evaluate impact and adopt best practice and also perhaps look at some training needs. And at the moment, I'm working approximately one day a week over a six month period. So I hope to get to know uh, at least some of you in that time. So um, before we begin, uh, I'm skipping all that, just got a quick question. Uh, what do, quick question for you, and it's more rhetorical, but what do Mahatma Gandhi, Conrad Adenauer, and Che Guevara have in common when it comes to scholarly writing, media mentions, and policy impact? If you think about that, I'll come back to that later. So I just want to start with, uh, going back to UNU Merit, is why we're talking about research, visibility, and impact. Well, for many reasons that we'll come on to, but, um, for one good one, it's in the impact section of the strategic plan. And I think there are three objectives to note that um, what we're trying to do at UNU Merit is to increase our collaboration with policy actors, to integrate policy considerations in the design and delivery of research, and to make our work more accessible to policy makers. And then for begs the question, what is, how do we define uh, research and uh, research impact and policy. So I've got two definitions, one from the ESRC and Collins. The ESRC is the UK's main funder of research and training in economic and social sciences. And they talk about research impact in the context of economic and societal impact. Again, this was covered in the working group's paper. And basically uh, it means that we're not only talking about academic impact, and I'm aware that impact means different things to different people at different times. And I aim to cover some of this in the presentation, but for our purposes here, I'm gonna combine the definitions and paraphrase them to say that what we're trying to do is to reach the right people to help them make the right decisions. And so a research at a very fundamental level must be visible in the right format, it must be timely. And we have to have all of those things together in order to make any kind of impact and there's it's always important to ask why you know why are we trying to do this why is you and you merit doing some restructuring why are we trying to increase visibility and putting energy and investment into shaping policy decisions i mean first we, we want to reach a more influential audience or audiences we want to make a difference and in comprehensive innovation for sustainable development and in terms of our research innovation Poverty, inequality, climate crisis, migration, you know, what is more pressing or important? And if we, secondly, if we agree, if, if we achieve greater impact on our work, our analysis, researchers, the organization itself will be held in, in a higher regard. And greater impact will help build our profile, boost the quality of our relationships with partners and funders. And a higher profile, stronger relationships will boost our track record increase our footprint and make it easier in future to shape policy priorities, i.e. more people will turn to us because they know that we know our stuff. We are the go-to place. And finally, overall, it would build our reputation individually, collectively, within our teams, and of course, institutionally. So hopefully, without this being too much of a statement of the obvious, that is why impact 
is important. But to understand how to achieve impact, I first want to just take a quick look at the many levels at which policy is formed. Now, most of you will be familiar with this and you're working at least at some of those levels, but from the UN to the EU, at national, regional, municipal and provincial and countless local levels, through a huge range of political institutions and structures, policy decisions are being taken and implemented all the time. There are many lawmaking bodies that could be particularly important to universities and to think tanks, including, you know, for example, the EU Director Generals, there's 33 of them, including on research and innovation on Horizon 2020. There are government departments, parliamentary committees. There are statutory bodies and regulators with sectoral or subject matter uh, responsibilities, including on technology and innovation, sustainable development. There are the utilities, there are the media, health regulators, and so on. And many of them are respected and influential and will already be on your radar. And that is just a snapshot to underscore my main point, which is that there are many ways into the policy process and it's incumbent on us to identify the most relevant way in. And so if policy is our target, which it is in this case, um, all of the activities around the target, whether it's the debate, consultation scrutiny, the legal rulings, inquiries, uh, they're all surrounded by multiple and complex influencers, including, of course, research groups, but also religious movements, media, corporate interests. They are all vying for attention and arguing their case and with different connections and with different ways of navigating an incredibly crowded and complex field. And this yeah. diagram, yeah. Can you just remind us what, what black swan events are? I, I can't remember. Uh, okay, black, I guess the pandemic's a bit of a black swan event. I mean, not if you're a researcher in the field, but a black swan event is just something that's unexpected that comes out of the blue and that would have a big impact. So again, if you're, if you're a scientist, uh, uh, you may have you've, you know, been predicting for years that a pandemic is going to happen at some point, but it generally that largely took most people by surprise. Um, so there are there are different ways, obviously, into the policy process. And this is really just a reminder uh, that for I would say for every project, for every report or major output that UNU Merit and other organizations produce, we need a bespoke and targeted approach that works for the organization and for the research teams and for the individuals uh, concerned, the individual researchers. And just to illustrate this, there's just one example that actually Howard shared with me um, a few weeks ago. And this comes from, this is uh, from, I think a flyer that was produced by the International Public Policy Observatory, which is a conglomeration of universities, think tanks and publishers that was set up to quote, give politicians the insights, evidence and analysis of global policy responses to COVID-19 to enable them to address the immediate social, economic and public health impacts and help communities get back on their feet. And then the really interesting part for me was the two direct appeals, one to policymakers and one to academics. And this direct appeal is, if you're a decision maker tackling the social impacts of COVID-19 and how to address them, we're keen to learn from your experiences and insights and shape our content accordingly. It's a very open and what I think would be effective approach. And similarly, they have a similarly worded appeal to academics who are researching social impacts of COVID. Um, I think this is very open, it's non-threatening, uh, it's a good way of engaging policymakers, and it's a great part of the IPPO's story, um, you know, when they're taking such an open, shared learning and inclusive approach to forming and influencing uh, policy. Um, and for you and you, Mera, I think as you know, one of the countless organizations and groups that will also be trying to reach some of the same types of people in policy circles, there's undoubtedly a way in and a role that we can identify for both universities and think tanks. And I'm putting universities and think tanks uh, together in this instance because there is overlap on policy impact issues and because some universities and think tanks are incredibly influential and we can learn a lot from each other 
and we can share specific lessons and some of which I'll come on to in the coming slides. But here, I just want to take a moment to think about the many positives that universities and think tanks and the researchers who are gathered here in this seminar bring to the development of policy. I mean, first, we have a, a first rate pedigree and track record. The images of Bologna, the oldest university in the world, founded in 1088. You know, so we're not Johnny come lately. We are immersed in our vast networks with extensive expertise. And we have the next generation of leaders and thinkers on tap. We have visibility, a huge variety of outputs and platforms and digital channels. We also have extensive private networks and connections at the highest level of policy making. And as we saw in the pandemic, you know, many universities capitalized on the need for expertise and they fed the demand for a greater understanding of what was happening. And as policymakers turned to academics and scientists for their knowledge and guidance, they very much came to rely on the credibility of the research. And universities and think tanks also know how to collaborate including internationally. And although we tend to look at a bigger, longer term picture, we can also be opportunistic in a good way and have an ability to respond effectively to short notice requests for policy briefs or op-eds. And when there's an opportunity to influence opinion and inform the debate and build relationships and partnerships. And of the many positives UN Merit as an organization has, relationships and partnerships are crucial to the development of policy, uh, not least as a UN agency. I think this is a great time to embrace our mandate as a UN um, uh, agency. Our many strengths include our relationship with UNU as a whole and the connection with Maastricht uh, and the benefits of its resources as well as our courses and programs and research units. On visibility, we have our partnership with the conversation, the YouTube presence, the website, social media channels, our event, the hub, and we have a commitment to funnel all of this critical mass and activity through the lens of comprehensive innovation for sustainable development. And in many ways, this is where think tanks can be particularly effective. They tend to position themselves, sometimes politically, uh, to influence policy. They sometimes have a clearer focus on their ambitions and identity. And there's often a, a, a great sense of urgency with think tanks. And I'm not saying all of the above is necessarily good or relevant to universities, but it's a reminder that we're operating in this very crowded field. Um, so what we find or what I'm seeing, and I'm sure all of you are aware now that um, there's a greater drive to have impact. And these are just some snapshots from University of Cambridge, Bristol, tips on creating uh, research impacts that are kind of often shared and promoted amongst academics. And Different organizations, of course, have different measurements of success and benchmarks, and they develop their own form of reporting. This is increasingly important for, fund, uh, for funders and think tanks. And that includes on outreach and visibility, engagement, diversity, inclusion, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, are increasingly important, uh, including for reasons associated with business growth, creativity, leveling up, and so on. And in my various roles, I have kept a watching eye on what think tanks in particular are doing, including the Chatham House. And specifically, Chatham House recently changed its annual review to its annual impact report with a much more dynamic tone, moving away from regional and thematic themes and lists of outputs and events to have a sharper focus on ideas and dialogue and empowering the next generation. And where policy changed was influenced and brought about. It's hard to claim, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, it's become very important for think tanks too to demonstrate policy relevance. And generally, as part of communications teams toolkits, we're also getting better at measuring impact and using Google Analytics and dashboards and tracking journeys, collecting data and statistics, developing online discussions, monitoring feedback and our recommendations uh, around our research output and at least highlighting them. And all of those activities 
help create a picture of how research is having an impact. And I'm going to suggest a model for tracking impact, or even perhaps just to help us think about it, um, based on four broad headings. And it's a very simple model. I've used it in the past to capture certain activities and outcomes. And uh, you know, it, it, it may or may not be right for you and you matter or other organization, but it certainly helped me from a communications perspective to understand and where necessary present uh, the what you know present the successes of research. So broadly speaking, um, we're talking about outreach, engagement, action, and implementation. And you could categorize outreach as one-way communications, engagement, two-way. Action is when some ideas have been put into action. Perhaps you're given evidence to a parliamentary committee or there's an inclusion in a white paper of an idea or a recommendation. And then implementation is where there, you can actually measure a policy change, a change in the law. Um, and, you know, it could be we look at building a reporting model based around these categories or something similar. Um, but I'll give you one example of how it worked in uh, when it was actually implemented at Chatham House. And you know this is this is a gold star success story. So not everything would be would work out like this. But basically, it was a, it was a two year project on universal health coverage that had many elements to it. But one of them was uh, included work on hospital detentions, whereby hundreds of thousands of people were held as prisoners in hospitals in a number of countries and if they couldn't afford to pay their hospital bills they were detained against their will and I, I will caveat what I'm about to say by sort of going back to my earlier comment on this being a crowded field where many organizations were and are working on this and so claiming overall credit for a change in the law is not necessarily credible but it is possible to pinpoint some specific successes and that's what we're trying to do here so first on outreach it's relatively straightforward in terms of capturing information uh, there were hundreds of articles interviews quotes and name checks there were a few op-eds there was one very main big two day feature in the New York Times and a documentary that was broadcast on BBC World. And on channel uh, and on the channels that uh, Chatham House owns, uh, there were a number of reads of expert comments or video views or tweets and retweets, impressions, engagements, likes and shares, the website traffic, report downloads and so on. So they all come with numbers and data. And those numbers can be used to benchmark compare and report and to contribute to a narrative. So that's the sort of outreach element. On engagement, there were high level engagements among others uh, 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 by the project leads who met and briefed ministers, prime ministers, and those meetings were recorded and documented and feedback and thanks were received. And when it came to action, there was some measurable action, particularly around the model that the team developed around financing the shortfalls that were caused by people's inability to pay uh, the hospital bills. And in several countries, including Kenya, hospital detentions were outlawed and new models were put in place for, fun, uh, for financing the shortfalls. Now, this brief example, there were lots more elements to this, but this brief example, uh, was, as I said, gold standard. And normally for most projects, most reports, most, you know, most initiatives, even a single event, there would be an outreach and engagement element, perhaps sometimes a bit of action. But we were able in this instance to capture very effectively information uh, on the two main categories. But then when the others came and we realized that there was real action, that, that was what really led it to be a, deemed a, an enormous success. And as I, I mentioned earlier, reporting to funders is an important driver of impact for think tanks. And so that all, almost always comes back to that in those instances. But for think tanks, there is also an element, perhaps paradoxically, of um, competition, but also knowledge sharing. So 20 years ago, I'd say think tanks didn't really talk to each other, and I mean mostly in a communication sense. But as communications activities have become necessarily more public, 
websites, email, social media activity, rankings, and so on. Think tanks have gotten very good at and very used to watching, sharing, and learning from each other. And there's a lot of talk now around you know, how we achieve more innovation and how think tanks can do research differently. How do they become more creative around the processes and the outputs? How do they reach new audiences? And this can be very attractive to policymakers. So I have two case studies, one very brief to show you and how I've been involved in meeting some of those challenges in the recent past. And the first is based on the, uh, the Chatham House Journal International Affairs, which was founded in 1922. It has a long and respected history, but by 2016, it felt like there was a little bit of inertia around it. Around it. it was lucrative and there was a reluctance to really look at it in a deep way because it wasn't broken by any means. So you know, why risk changing it? But its impact factor ranking was 16. It was very male dominated in terms of the authors. We had a long standing publisher who was frankly not as interested perhaps as they could have been. There were few citations, there was limited visibility and outreach around the content. And then fast forward to uh, last year, the impact factor ranking was one. It was Clarivate's most influential IR journal. There have been a number of special issues on uh, parts of the world that it previously hadn't focused on as much. 54% of the contributors identified as female. And we were able to target some key high profile authors. One of the things that we did that has been enormously successful was uh, developed a range of initiatives around the core research product. And the core research product is high quality, peer reviewed academic research. And there's no way that that was to be diminished or weakened in any way. However, it was clearly possible that we could develop some new pathways into the research. So on Medium, we published blogs and explainers, sometimes by the authors, perhaps as a more accessible summary of the main article, or by another expert on the topic or by a journalist, always with the objective of adding something to the analysis. And this helped us with our social media presence. We could more easily develop visuals and snappier summaries and link to the content that and link to content that wasn't behind the paywall. Although the new publishers were actually tremendous at making the articles available for free. Similarly, uh, we had op-eds as versions of the main articles, and this was particularly useful for special issues. It provided a new route to the research and to the journal itself. And the special issue on India was accompanied by articles in the Times of India, the Hindustan Times and others, as well as uh, interviews in the broadcast media by some of the contributors. And we also uh, use more digital marketing techniques. So paid for ads on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook to increase followers, traffic, reads, downloads and so on. And with the added benefit of providing us with information on our new audiences. So we were able to test and learn. And we also brought the submissions process online and used events and conferences to run, meet the editor sessions on how to get published. And we created blogs on those too. Um, we also told a better story about the journal's history and its authors. We explained who the authors were and in the, who they were and their roles in the context of the time. And sometimes we were able to connect them with today's issues. Sometimes we didn't need to explain who the authors were. So we go back to Gandhi, Conrad Adenauer, and Che Guevara. They were all contributors to international affairs, the journal over the decades. And that was another bonus that we realized that it was very attractive to, to authors. So by creating the stepping stones to better understand the issues, to access the true academic research, and by bringing in voices from the global south and by creating some momentum around the main content we were able to start to claim some policy influence too um, and one of the last things I did uh, at Chatham House last year was based on an article in International Affairs on virtual diplomacy 
as part of the outreach, we ran a webinar with the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a number of experts on digital diplomacy. And the content was great. The original article was fantastic, but the real win was the audience. We had something like 400 attendees, including a large number of diplomats from across Europe and beyond. And the panelists were able to draw new ideas from the discussion. And the International Affairs team is now working with the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to develop some of the ideas that were generated by the discussion, building on the original article. And a second article will be published later this year and a second round of debate and discussion. So, you know, again, that example is important as well because crucially we were able to boost the visibility by being creative, but again, without any compromise to the academic rigor. In fact, arguably that's been strengthened. I said two case studies. Um, the second one is uh, an initiative that we created called the CoLab. And the specific objective was to develop new innovative ways to undertake research and develop outcomes that are solutions focused and that uh, project a more positive um, and achievable vision of, of the future, and including some practical steps for policymakers on, on how to get there. So we wanted to develop a model for the future of city centres, and we used Piccadilly Circus, which was just around the corner from Chatham House, uh, to create a framework that could be used for other cities. So we ran workshops with our researchers, um, with academics and some policymakers and journalists, but we also included retailers, architects, designers, futurologists, writers, local historians, students. And we, we wanted to be creative, but realistic. So for example, when we were thinking about technology, we only factored in technology that already exists. So for policymakers, the outcomes were already within their grasp. And you know, the outputs were to be immersive. So we created an interactive 3D digital model, as well as held a physical exhibition that was taken to conferences, displayed it in Chatham House, and featured at uh, Somerset House in the London, uh, at the London Design Biennale last summer. Also, we used the opportunity and some of the funds to experiment with some digital marketing. Now, this is geeky comms perspective, but for me, it was the biggest and perhaps the most interesting part because we were able to target social media and although we did it with international affairs we did it actually in a lot more in a more sophisticated way in, in this example so we targeted individuals on social media with the aim of either getting them to read watch listen to our content hopefully comment as well uh, to then either click through to related content to sign up for an email to attend an event or possibly even to become a member or an associate member of Chatham House. And we were able to target publicly available information. So for example, on LinkedIn, based on someone's job title, their organization, their interests, or on Twitter because of the subject matter they tweet about or their, their byline, and also on Facebook because of their interests, the interest groups and, and so on. So it was a very successful way to reach new audiences and they were good relevant audiences and contacts who otherwise may not have been on our radar or indeed ours on theirs. But it was also a, a new way to boost numbers, just you know, more reads, more video views, and in some cases to engage some experts and policymakers, again, that weren't possibly in our orbit, that were based outside of the UK. Now, my prediction, again, is the geeky comms perspective, but as my prediction is that digital marketing, as it gets more sophisticated, and as we expect of only targeted and relevant communications in our private lives from retailers, entertainment groups, and so on, so we're going to expect the same from think tanks and universities. You know, in other words, audiences will expect us to know more about them and their interests. So, um, some common threads of success and some general lessons learned from these case studies that hopefully you, some of you have found of some interest. So first thing is each project has to have clear objectives. You know, sometimes it took a while to develop them, but when we did and we had a bespoke strategy in place, it was much easier to see where we were going, what the measures of success were. We planned early. The comms team and the researchers 
working together uh, and both having to learn that you know it's a two-way street and they were also uh, collective using collective efforts to draw from across the organization but with one individual as the lead it's always important to have a formal owner for any project large or small and you need a strategy for the duration of the project uh, and that generally involves all the stakeholders throughout Sometimes you pass the baton from one to another, but broadly speaking, everyone needs to be involved throughout. I think it really works effectively when the comms element or indeed any other element is an add-on or an afterthought. And another lesson would be, don't be afraid to be bold and to experiment. For the CoLab example I gave, you know, we had the blessing of the funder to experiment and fail. He told us that think tanks have amazing, but often boring output. Because of that, uh, it wouldn't cut through and we wouldn't be making a difference to anyone, including policymakers. So in that instance, we were lucky and that was unusual to have the blessing, but it helped a lot. So I look forward in the coming weeks or months to being bold or boldish with a lot of you. Um, that's the end of the presentation. So I think we now have some time for Q&A. Okay, thanks very much, Keith. That was super clear. And I've actually got some uh, some compliments for you on the chat directly to me already, but uh, we can share that, that with you later. Um, compliments always good, thank you. Uh, just just a note good, to everybody, um, this it is being recorded and we'll we'll add the link and share that with everybody later on, just because uh, I know some people had to leave early or some people came late. Um, so uh, any questions, please? We have one in the chat. Can you see that, Keith? Um, I'll just pull it up now. Very nice to know about media outreach. This is from uh, Enok Kumar Das. Nice to meet and uh, know about media outreach, International Affairs Journal, beyond the Western countries. Did you engage PR group for that purpose? No, we tend for the international affairs example. We tended to work internally, and it started. We had a part-time, two-day-a-week masters. Uh, ben Horton. I don't know. Some of you may know him. Uh, ben started about five years ago and was doing two days a week, largely on social media. And then we built up where we, when we built up and then we were used, we were developing relationships with the authors and their institutes and we were using the wider network. Where we used a PR or an agency, a digital comms agency was on the proper digital marketing and outreach. So we, um, we used a company called Torchbox who specialized in digital marketing. And when we got into the pandemic and we're launching the new website, connecting to the CoLab and a couple of other initiatives, that was when we started to use the digital marketing techniques that I mentioned were quite geeky and of interest to me. But largely speaking, we don't. The, the, uh, the, the energy and environment team at Chatham House had some specialist PR support and that was really useful for COP and other big initiatives because they're connected to journalists. They know the topics. You know, sad to say, comms teams don't know the topics, but they know the field. So bringing in specialists once in a while could work. I think we have Nordine next. Hey, Nordine. Hi, Kate. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for for this interesting uh, presentation, and um, yeah, you've made uh, some great, uh, let's say, um, contributions in terms of examples and, and cases uh, that we could uh, explore further on. And I'm also very happy that uh, that you've picked up on this uh, on this topic. Uh, to me, it seems already uh, a while ago, <laughs> ages ago, that we've uh, written this uh, strategy uh, report. So I would like to say I'm very happy that uh, the communications department is, is picking this up and that, uh, that you've dedicated uh, uh, some time uh, on this. Very much appreciate it. Um, I have a, a more or less similar uh, question uh, as Francisca, um, but you, you started uh, uh, in November um, and we have identified some, let's say, some actions in the strategy report mm -hmm. where we think uh, Union Merit could really Proof upon. Um, in your experience, um, reading the strategy report and uh, getting to know uh, the Institute, where do you think um, our opportunities on the short term uh, lie? Thank you. 
Okay, good question. And I'll try and link it to Francisca's. It, look, you have, as many universities and think tanks do, you have great content. You're working on very pressing and relevant topics. There is, you know, there is a big appetite in policy circles, in the media, on social media, students, there's a big appetite. So the, the trick is you've got to focus on the content that is going to work, that can be adapted, uh, that is going to be, that will work on other channels. And you have to, we have to, we have to get to a place where we know what our priorities are. And that can sometimes be tough. So we are actually working at the moment on a way to identify the priority outputs, where are we going to put our resources? Because the key thing in all of this is that we have very limited resources. And even at Chatham House, there was, until about three or four years ago, there was one part-time person working on social media for the organization. So, you know, we have to choose what we're going to do um, with the resources. We have to identify the priorities as well as identify the opportunities. And I think that the strategic plan Indeed, the working group's paper has made a they made really good you know first steps down this road. What we have to do is work collectively. We have to you know have buy-in, and you know I think that's what we're doing at the moment behind the scenes. But Howard, you're probably better placed to answer, perhaps, than me. Well, I mean, as you mentioned in the in the presentation, I mean funneling uh, vast amount of our content through the new comprehensive innovation for sustainable development lens that already is focusing our plans and ideas for the future. Um, so it's, it's not you know, re, reinventing the wheel, but it's basically helping us to focus in a way that we haven't done so well, I think, in the last few years. So. It's, it, you know, it always seems to me there's so much going on. There's so many outputs. There are so, so, many, so many good things happening. And it's like, you know, it's not, it's almost like you have to make a choice of what you're going to lift and when, and you go around and everybody gets a chance at some point. Uh, but I, I, that's how I see it at the moment. I mean, I could be wrong, but that's, that's kind of how I see it at the moment. I think Shiana's next with her hand up. Hello. Hi, Keith. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, you. My question is as follows. A number of us in UNU Merit work on technology and innovation. Now, uh, it doesn't, many aspects of this and many of the types of technologies we are working on do not lend themselves to be uh, issues of international policy debate. So I was wondering in international affairs, you know, what kind of, what kind of themes have you, ha, has the journal treated? And uh, what are your views for uh, taking knowledge from this, which is maybe not amenable to a specific policy reform, but just kind of things that can facilitate sustainable de development? What do you deal with? Uh, how do you deal with uh, articles that don't have a specific policy reform, but generally say the usual words, you know, policies should consider it or this should be introduced better, or it should be, be done better. What do you do with the vagologies uh, that uh, might come from a general research? Yeah, well, international affairs, the, 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 it leans towards policy, but, you know, again, it, it, it's, I suppose it leans towards being policy friendly, but it is academic, it's peer reviewed, it's blind peer reviewed anyone's in, welcome and entitled to make a submission. I think that the, the example I gave on uh, diplomacy was an area that hadn't been covered for a while or um, virtual diplomacy. So it felt like a good idea. And I'm not sure, I mean, it, I'm sure there were submissions, you know, th there were maybe many submissions or several submissions or maybe only one but when the idea comes up and the editorial team think, oh, we haven't covered that, we could be looking, that's when there's an opportunity to perhaps approach an author. But if you're, if you're interested in pitching, then I can, I can help you <laughs> do it. Um, but it's, yeah, there would be, 
there's an editorial board as well. So they are there's an international editorial board and an editorial board, and they will all contribute based on institutes around the world. They will all contribute to ideas and where it feels like there's a gap, we may or they may proactively seek to plug that gap or they may act to have something that comes in that they hadn't thought about. And then I suppose for, on the wider outreach point, yeah, what it looks like or it feels like to the outreach team that there's an opportunity to capitalize, to make more of it, then they will do so. It's not going to work in every case. It doesn't work for every example, for every paper, uh, for every researcher. It's not, not everything's going to fly either in an academic journal or as a report or even as a, a, a thread on Twitter. Um, but you tend to, that's where, that's where collaboration comes in. That's where it's good to talk to the communications team, the communications team to you know, work with the researchers to work out what is going to have the greater impact, what's the way in. And that's why I said for every report, every output, probably every event even, there should be a, a strategy or a mini strategy uh, where you know what you want to achieve, who you want to reach, why it's important, why you're doing it. And you know how can we make more of it? How can you flex it? Because a standalone piece is great, but if it's part of a series or if there's other content, then you're obviously maximizing its benefit. Thank you. Tommaso was up next. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Keith. Um, nice, nice to meet you virtually. Um, <clears throat> I think this was a, a, a really nice uh, overview. And uh, I have three, three quick um, questions. The first one is about the measurement of impact. Uh, we all know measuring impact is extremely difficult. So do we have in mind here a model in which if your research is cited in policy platform, if uh, it goes through parliaments and audition uh, or whatever, you know, it's uh, in, in a political debate as an impact, or do we refer it as impact as something that actually has, you know, uh, an end public good for um, those uh, who are most in need or those for whom the, the research was, uh, was done. And the second related question was that, <clears throat> In the, in, in the initial overview that you gave us, the, the example were all extremely appropriate, but I think the focus was mainly on high level policymakers. Yeah. Uh, there was not much on civil society, grassroots movements, final users. Um, so how do we integrate those in, in, in the impact, in, in those discussions, in influencing not only policymakers, but also in having an impact on, on final users? Sure. So and. Oh, sorry, just, just sorry, oh, no, just no, adding no, a, a third very quick question in, in, in that because I think it's related. In that sense, um, how much um, should we rely? What is the balance in, in this communication strategy relying between um, labels, uh, which may be very useful on the communication side, and I totally understand they need to be used to clarify the concepts, and content, uh, which may not be easily simplified into labels? Yeah, no, and that these are all really valid uh, points. And obviously, I'm coming at it from a communications perspective. And, and the example I gave, I know on, on the surface, it, it looks sort of pretty basic outreach, engagement, action, implementation, and so on. And it, what we try to do, so, so th that came from a need within Chatham House to report quarterly to the board on impact and this this became a big thing for the, the previous chair who uh, uh, Jim O'Neill who had been at Goldman Sachs and he he just wanted results and he came with a Goldman Sachs mindset um, to Chatham House to a think tank and you know there were often paths were being missed not even close to being crossed but he 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 did bring something that at least made us think about you know how do we it's like what he kept on saying what difference are you making what difference and I was like, well it doesn't always work like that so the difference that in the example that i gave on uh, hospital detentions was real there was a there was a law change chatham house was part of a, a group of organizations who were you know who were almost lobbying for, for that change and i called that gold star but i just meant in terms of capturing and telling a story at, at for so many projects and outputs, 
you know, when we were talking to researchers, when there's a paper coming out, um, to the to the author, they may have said to us, it's a very technical bit of paper, so you're not going to get much traction with a journalist. Or, but there is always, if there, if there's a desire, and again, it's often funder led, or at least there's a thought that funders are kind of on your shoulder. You look at the piece of work, and you know, people spending weeks, months producing it, they're running workshops and seminars. Ideas come from those seminars and at the very least an understanding of an issue. So someone somewhere, whether it's a journalist, whether it's a, 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 a policymaker, the highest or lowest, if that's the right phrase, level, um, there are other organizations. So who do you want to reach? Who do you want to know about your research? And it certainly doesn't have to be that you want to change the law in Kenya. It's just about the conversation and the planning would be around thinking about what you want to achieve, either big or small. And small is perfect. Again, these are quite loaded terms, but you know, nuanced is perfectly acceptable. And sometimes there isn't much need for a communications team, but sometimes there is. And sometimes if you, know, you have a good, a strong piece of work, the conversation is a great outlet to, you know, to be working and being published on. There's, there's a body of work that you build up that's accessible and accessible over time. So I guess, I think you mentioned like a, a balanced comm strategy. You have to go, you have to look at every piece of work, every output on its own merits. And it doesn't matter you know, what you're trying to achieve as long as you're trying to achieve something sensible with the work on behalf of the researcher, on behalf of the organization. That, does that answer your question or make sense? Howard, you might have something to say. Yeah, you're... I mean, just, I mean, Tommaso was also highlighting the, you know, not top tier policymakers and decision makers. And we yeah. also basically work, but I mean, I remember you had that in one of your slides uh, earlier on, just in terms of, you know, and it was something I'd never thought of before. So working with, you know, of what utilities and regulators and local councils as well. I mean, that is actually where some of the kind of lowest hanging fruits, so to speak, or, or you know, real change can be made. Um, right? I mean, this is that's that's just something that struck me. Is this is this echoing what you're saying, Tomaso? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think so. <clears throat> yeah. 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 I was also thinking about civil society, really. Um, NGOs and, and 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 how to you know uh, get 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 the sense of uh, uh, how they are impacted by, by what we're saying, right? So it's just not a conversation with policy makers, but I think it should be a conversation also with uh, with with the final users. If if we make the distinction between uh, 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 intermediate users and final users. Okay, I... up from Shyama there, who's who runs an NGO uh, friend in need in India. Okay. Sorry, Keith, carry on. Thanks. So there are some questions as well in the chat. So I, I'll, I'll start at the bottom up. Um, are we going to have a clear new communications and marketing plan soon for you and you met it? Uh, this all seems super vague to me. Yes is the short answer. That's what we're working on. Um, I, I, I don't know how super clear it could be, but, you know, that's that's the idea. Um, I think tanks become more do tanks. Uh Yes, I think there's a lot of talk around that. Um, I, yeah, it, it's an ongoing discussion. And, you know, part of the community is, and I mentioned, I think, in the, in the presentation that, you know, there's a lot of learning from each other and there's a lot of watching. And I think the good thing to see is that where there's good, where there's sort of best practice and positives, people look and learn. But people are also, or think tanks, tend to know their own territory quite well, and they hold their ground. So some are very against calling themselves do tanks because they want to be in the mix of research. They want to be involved in the community and not necessarily campaigning or you know one side of the political divide or or another. Um, but I, I definitely think think tanks have been. And some, certainly maybe on the, in the States, but some are very creative with their communications. And, you know, whether that's really necessary or important, I think it probably is. Um, but there's certainly another argument for taking a step back, for being a bit less whizzy 
um, and for focusing more on quality of research than kind of headlines. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, you can do both. And that's what I, I, I thought or hoped Chatham House did. And there, uh, there's a question from Siddharth. Uh, are there any collaboration exchange programs, fellowships with UNU Merit available for PhD scholars from India? I'm reading that question out. Anyone? I think we need, I think we need to uh, refer that one. Okay. We'll, we'll try and come back to you on that. Um, how do you identify research to be promoted from UNU Merit? That's a good question, Klaus. Um, and I think that we're working on that at the moment. That's what will have to come out in the strategy. So, you know, we obviously have comms priorities and comms resources that we have to match up with UNU overall uh, strategy and objectives, as well as the individual objectives and strategies of the research units and individual researchers. So getting to a place where they can all come together comfortably, I think would be, would be the ideal. And plans and ideas for UNU Merit, well, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're trying to develop a, a communications and marketing plan that's drawing on the elements of the overall strategic plan that Bartel published last year, as well as building on the existing comms strategy and on the restructure and on the priorities of the research units. That makes sense, Howard? Yeah, yeah. I think also just one thing that, that struck me was, I mean, you said uh, in order to be uh, attractive to policymakers, in order to you know, get their attention, it's, it's a combination of uh, somehow you know, keeping the quality of research, but trying to do things differently in terms of packaging it in the communications, uh, in terms of communications, and you gave the example of the you know, international affairs. Um, just any final words on that, really? I mean, just any any other perspectives, sort of how how you and you merit our people, and because I think we're actually sort of similar size. I mean, how many how many researchers working in think in Chatham House? A couple of hundred. Yeah, there's probably about, um, I think eighty or ninety on staff, and then there's some probably the same for consultants and associate fellows. And the associate fellows are flexed as and when, so some of them are quite active and always engaged or sort of engaged for quite long periods of time on, on, um, on projects. Others might be more perennials. They're there in the background because they're good to have and we draw upon them sometimes for the media. They, certainly the research programs, we draw on them for events, perhaps to help with funding proposals and so on. So uh, to me, it's a good system. It, it's work that stood the test of time. Although there is... Um, it's a fairly new uh, deputy director who's overseeing a mini restructure of research at the moment. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how that will pan out. Also, the director, Chatham House director, is leaving this year, so that could be, and in some interesting changes coming up. And but specifically, oh, pardon me, uh, specifically on uh, you asked quite on international affairs and resources there, Howard. Yeah, I might, the question I was getting to was, was okay, so I mean, at UNU Merit, we have about 70 or so researchers and professors and 80 or so PhD fellows, so 150, so relatively equivalent number of uh, researchers to service sort of on, from the communications front. Um, how big was your team in Chatham House? I mean, I know you said, you know, previously it was, it was very small, but you, you built it up. So yeah, it, it, just in terms of a being ambitious, but b being able to do things differently. Uh, you know, how how deep was your bench in communications? Yeah, I think in total when I left, there were nearly thirty members of staff on the communications team. That included uh, working on the journal, uh, the magazine. We had a big digital transformation team who were quite technical. So they were doing the, you know, the hosting, the website, the development. And we had like nine microsites as well there. But when it came to the maybe three or four full-time editors who were you know, working on the research. So it was a really big team. Although when you came down to it, as I said, there was only one full-time social media manager who joined 
about three or four years ago, he just left. There was a part-time person, as I mentioned, on international affairs doing social media. But then the research units also sometimes had their own people who would be perhaps an administrator or a manager, and they would take responsibility for the research unit's individual uh, Twitter account, for example. So overall, there were a huge number of people working on communications. And a lot of it was to keep the wheels turning. So, and you know, if the research programs were producing something like a hundred research reports a year, then you need an editorial capacity that you don't have a choice over. I mean, you can flex, you can bring in um, freelancers and so on. But you know, the bulk of the communications team were there just to keep the wheels turning. And then as we grew a little bit, and certainly on the digital marketing side, for example, we were able to bring in somebody to do that. Now that to me is a beautiful add-on. That's where you can really learn to innovate and experiment and do something different. But when you're just keeping the wheels turning, you have tend to have uh, some core people. And you know, keeping the wheels turning is good. You know, Producing good and well-edited and beautifully written research reports is very important. But yeah, you, yeah, it all it does come back to resources. The more the more you have, I would well, not necessarily the better, but the more you have, the more you can do. Of yep. course. So you had a solid core, but then built built outwards from that for individual projects and new initiatives, basically. Yeah. Yes, and occasionally we could work with external agencies or PR companies, as I as I touched upon in the in the I think earlier. Um, oh, we've got the question in terms of applying for the program. Uh, yeah, that's Francisca re replying directly. So yeah, that's great. That's fine. Okay, well, um, I think that's covered any everything. So thanks very much, Keith. Um, that's super interesting to get very different perspectives from what we're used to. Uh, also, obviously, nice to see Che Guevara and uh, Mahatma Gandhi on the same slide for, for once. Um, so thanks again, and um, just just a quick note to everybody: we'll we'll um, put the recording uh, on the on the YouTube and share this with you uh, in the next couple of days. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, any questions or comments, please just uh, email me direct or message me direct. It's good to meet you. E meet you. Thank you. Joining everyone. Thank you. Take care. Cheers.